Well, hello. It's lovely to be with you again at Bowness Baptist Church, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come once again and to open the Word of God with you as we look, with the Lord's help, at the second half of the first chapter of Colossians. I hope that you're all keeping safe and well, uh, and keeping your eyes on Jesus during these dark and difficult days uh, for our world. Well, I'd like to turn you then to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to continue reading in this chapter from verse 15 until the end of the chapter, from verse 15 until the end. And I would like to look with you at this lovely chapter, these amazing uh, sections, particularly about the person of Christ in his beauty and his majesty. Uh, we're going to look at it under three headings. So firstly, in verses uh, 15 to 20, we're going to think about the headship of Christ, the headship of Christ. And that is, in fact, one of the key themes of uh, the epistle to the Colossians, the headship of Christ. And then from verse 21 down to verse 23, the holiness of the believer, the holiness of the believer. And then from verse 24 down to the end of the chapter, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. So those are our three headings for this evening. And before we open God's word together, let's just come before him once again in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth its clarity and its power. And we do pray uh, that as we open the pages of your holy word this evening, that you would speak to our hearts, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that the Lord Jesus Christ would be our focus. We pray that we might love him more as a result of this time spent in your word. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well then, let's begin by reading the verses 15 to 20, some of the most sublime verses in our New Testament. Uh, thinking about the headship of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. And God will add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. These verses, as I've said, are absolutely uh, remarkable. And they form uh, what many think was an early Christian hymn, or perhaps a, a statement of faith that would have been recited, uh, memorised, um, something like that. A hymn or a statement of faith, or both combined. Uh, some of our uh, greatest hymns are really statements of faith, aren't they? And uh, my grandmother, for instance, was in a nursing home in Brothy Ferry, and um, she wouldn't have been able to tell you uh, what she'd had for lunch that day, but she could remember great hymns of the faith and verses from the scripture. So this may well have been one of those sort of early Christian hymns that rehearsed what it is they believed about the person who's at the center of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In these five verses, we have a panorama of God's plan of salvation, really from creation all the way through to the reconciliation of all things in and under and through Christ. Go back with me to verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation firstborn of all creation firstborn in his superiority and in his priority of course not the first to be created he was begotten and not created the jehovah's witnesses would twist uh, verses like this to uh, try and uh, and suit their claim that jesus is a created uh, being and yet of course we understand that when we speak about him as the firstborn it's in terms of his priority and his superiority uh, not his uh, physical origins. So he's the firstborn of all creation. But then, verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. One day, friends, everything's going to be reconciled in and under Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We live in a world of conflict. And uh, since the war in Ukraine began, we've all been thinking about it, haven't we? Uh, we can't help but think about it when we look on our TV screens and read our newspapers. And yet there's one who's made peace. There's one who's made peace. He's made peace possible by the shedding of his precious blood on the cross of Calvary. 
So from the creation of all things to the reconciliation of all things. What's at the centre of it? The centre of it, verse 18, that in everything, that in everything he might be preeminent. The preeminence of Christ is at the very centre of God's plan for all time. If you were to ask the people of Bowness, you know, where is this world heading? Or, or the people of Thornton, where Rebecca and I live, they, they might give you a whole range of different answers. But, but we as God's people know this, that everything is headed towards the reconciliation of all things. And it is going to serve to make Christ preeminent. Preeminent. He's going to be at the centre of everything. God's glory it will be achieved uh, in and through the exaltation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are a number of different aspects of the Lord's deity brought out here. And if we were to uh, spend the time they deserve, perhaps on each of them, uh, we could do a whole series of Sunday nights just on these few verses, I'm sure. But let's just look briefly at them. We've got this. We've got the image of the invisible God. We've got the firstborn of all creation. Then we read that not only uh, is he the firstborn of creation, he's the creator himself. By him, all things were created. He's also the sustainer of life. In him all things hold together or consist. Now all of these things were true of the Lord Jesus without any reference to the church. All of these things were, were true of him before his incarnation. And yet then we go on to read about things that are true in relation to him and us, his church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And then we read that he's the head of the body, the church the headship of Christ. There are two discernible lines of teaching in the scriptures about the body. I'm sure we're all, we're all very familiar with the, the truth that the church is the body of Christ. And yet, just like you might go down into a coal mine, not that I ever have, but you go into, down into a coal mine or a gold mine or something and you can see separate seams of gold or seams of coal. So in the New Testament, there are two seams of teaching about the church as the body or a body and I'd like just to identify them uh, with you for a moment because I think it's good that they be distinguished now of course they're related but it's good that they be distinguished so let's turn to Romans please let's turn to Romans to begin with in chapter 12 Romans in chapter 12 and read with me verses 4 and 5 for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. The idea here, the emphasis here, is of unity and diversity. That yes, we are all um, different, we all have our own gifts, we all have our own propensities, our own personalities, and yet we are united. We are united as one body in Christ one body in Christ and yet and yet if we go on to 1 Corinthians 12 we read about another emphasis 1 Corinthians 12 and this is just sticking to that first seam of teaching um, about the body 1 Corinthians 12 and um, we'll read from verse 12 for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body though many are one body so it is with Christ for in one spirit we were all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. But then look with me down to verse 16 and 17. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? So you can see the emphasis. It's a very simple picture. That just as the body has many different parts, they're all necessary. They all have their own function. But what we notice here that distinguishes this Romans and 1 Corinthians uh, seam of truth about the body is this. That the head is identified as part of the body. So you have ears and eyes and the nose, etc. All spoken about here. Now, how do we understand that if Christ is the head of the body? When we've been speaking here in 1 Corinthians about members of the body like you and me being noses and eyes and ears. Well, I think it's because these are two different seams. And, and here the emphasis is unity and diversity. 
And yet there's another seam of truth about it, where the emphasis is authority and identity. So turn with me to Ephesians this time, to Ephesians and chapter 1. Ephesians in chapter 1. And we'll read from verse 22. And here we read this. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then chapter 4 of Ephesians. Chapter 4 of Ephesians, and uh, verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, with each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the idea here is of authority and identity that Christ, our head, is in heaven. If somebody was to say to you, who's in charge of Bowness Baptist Church? Well, you might point to one or two individuals who carry responsibility in the life of your local church. But ultimately, you would be able to say, no, no, the, the, the person who's in charge of Bowness Baptist Church is Christ. If somebody was to say to you, where's the headquarters of your denomination? You would say, well, that doesn't matter. Our headquarters are in heaven. Our headquarters are in heaven and there is our head. And there is nothing else between this local church and heaven. Christ and Bowness Baptist Church. And that's it. Everything else is man-made. So here we have Bowness Baptist Church. And it's directly accountable to only one person. And that is our blessed saviour at God's right hand. Christ in heaven. How wonderful is that? Headship has been a battleground over church history, hasn't it? And it's very sad uh, to see as this truth has had to be fought for uh, so many times as others have sought to take the place that only Christ can take. But each local church, each local church has only one head, and that is Christ in heaven. There is only one body. There are not lots of little bodies, not lots of little bodies around. There's only one body. And yet, of course, each local church functions like a body in that Romans and 1 Corinthians sense, because we have unity in diversity, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in Christ. The total, the complete, the ultimate fulfilment of deity is found in him, found in him. So let's move on now to think about the holiness of believers. The holiness of believers, and we'll read from verse 21. And you who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And again, God will add his own blessing to the reading of his word. We're continuing the theme really of reconciliation. He is now reconciled, verse 22, in his body of flesh by his death. And look at the tense with me. It's a past tense. You, he has reconciled. He has now reconciled in his body. It's past tense language. We cannot be unreconciled. We cannot be unreconciled. There is a, a controversy that, that rages sometimes, isn't there, between uh, Christians. Can you lose your salvation? Can you lose your salvation? Well, verses like this just make it so clear to us. How could you be unreconciled? Who would be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Once you have been redeemed, can you be unredeemed? Once you have been born again, can you be unborn again? Of course, we all realise that there are such things as false professions of faith and people who give the, the early signs perhaps of coming to faith but really have never trusted the Saviour in a personal way. That is different from this. What we're talking about is this. You cannot be unreconciled. So we have reconciliation. But we also have presentation. Verse 22. Look with, with me to verse 22. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And then a sentence that could make us, uh, could make, make us anxious. If indeed... You continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, 
not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Well, friends, have any of us, have any of us from the moment of our conversion to now been always stable and always steadfast? And so are we not going to be presented holy and blameless and above reproach before him if if we haven't continued stably and steadfastly uh, in our profession of the gospel? Well, I think it's related to something we find a little bit later. Look down with me to verse 28 and the theme of maturity comes here again. Him we proclaim, writes the apostle, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. I believe this is related to our rewards as believers. Now this is a an area of teaching that perhaps uh, is neglected today, perhaps um, many choose not to touch on. And yet I think it's important. And so I'd like to ask you to turn back to 1 Corinthians 3, please. To 1 Corinthians 3, just to remind ourselves of this. Uh, an area of truth, again, which is perhaps not always uh, touched on. 1 Corinthians 3, and let's read from verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And then over to chapter 4 and verse 5 of the same book. Chapter 4 and verse 5. Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Friends, there's a day coming in the future when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return for those who believe in him. And I know this is something that you believe at Bonus Baptist Church, what we call the rapture of the church. When the Lord Jesus, as he promised in John 14 and as we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and elsewhere too, is coming for those who know and love him. And when we go, when we rise to be in the Father's house, I believe that two principal events are going to take place. And the first of those, I believe, is the evaluation that we call the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this judgment seat of Christ has nothing whatsoever to do with sin. It's important to state that and to clarify that. Because as far as you and I are concerned as born again believers in Jesus Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of our sin has been washed away. There is no more to pay. There is no sin to be accountable for before the throne of God. But there is coming a day when the works that you and I have done uh, in the body of Christ, the works that you and I have done uh, while here upon the earth, will be evaluated and there will be rewards. They will be evaluated. Now, that is a sombre thing. It's a sober thing. Every motivation of the heart will be laid bare. And the the methods and, uh, and the motives behind our Christian service are seen and understood by Christ much better uh, than we see and understand them ourselves. Of course, it's perfectly true, perfectly possible, isn't it, that we can do things that appear godly on the outside, but actually our motivations for them are selfish uh, or we have uh, some sort of skewed motivation. And one day uh, there will be a great evaluation of all Christian service, and I'm sure there will be a great many surprises. And for those of us who handle the word of God, it's a very somber thing uh, to consider. And yet... Brothers and sisters, we remember that the very one who is entrusted with that evaluation, Christ, because all judgment has been committed to the Son, that this evaluation is being done, being conducted by the one who loved us enough to go to the cross of Calvary and there to pay the price for our sin. The one who is the gentle shepherd, the one who is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. So this one who is presently our advocate will one day be our evaluator. And yet we can trust him totally with that evaluation. And so that's what I believe uh, Paul has in mind here as he talks about uh, this presentation uh, of the believers in the future. 
Well, let's move on. Uh, we've thought about uh, the headship of Christ and the holiness of believers. But let's go on uh, to think about the hope of glory. The hope of glory. And we'll read from verse 24 down to verse 29. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, there we have that teaching again, of which I became a minister. A minister. Now of course that word minister um, is different to what we think of today as, as ministers. This is just simply a servant. According to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a wonderful verse. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present, here we have it again, everyone mature in Christ. For this I, for this I toil, struggling, the word is agonizomenos, agonizing, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul recognises right there at the end, doesn't he? It's not his energy. This apostle Paul that has this great heart for the believers is the same man who was on his way to imprison and persecute believers in Damascus when the risen Christ arrested him there on his on the road to Damascus and began to form and, and, and create in this man the very image of Christ and to give him this heart this energy that toils within him. He understands it doesn't come from him. This comes from heaven. This is the energy that he powerfully works within me. Well, the hope of glory. Then in this section, as we begin to draw our thoughts to a close, he says he is going to fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, that is, the church. What does he mean by that? Fill up, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Well, you know, Paul never forgot the lesson that he learned on the road to Damascus. The, the lesson he learned there was that Christ and his church are inextricably linked. You can't separate them. To touch Christ is to touch the church. What did he say? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He, he could have said, I suppose, but, but I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting these Christians. And the Lord would have said, yes, but to persecute them, to touch them, to seek to harm and hinder them, is to seek to touch, to harm, to hinder me. And of course, all who have pitted themselves against God's people, whether Israel in the old dispensation or whether God's people, the church now and the nation of Israel included, are uh, on, a, on a hiding to nothing, aren't they? They've hitched their wagon uh, to a, a course of absolute failure because they pitted themselves against the true and the living God. So there is no need there is no need to supplement the sacrifice of Calvary. I'm sure that we all believe that. Once and forever done, the price is paid and there's no more to pay. The work of salvation is done. That's why the Lord Jesus has a seated position at the right hand of the majesty on high because the work is done. Done is the work that saves. Once and forever done is a hymn that we sometimes sing in our assembly. But there is something here uh, related to that lesson that he learned and the road to Damascus, because the Lord Jesus had suffered on the cross. That's absolutely right. And that suffering did not need to be increased. It didn't need to be supplemented. And yet, the Lord says, why persecute thou me? So we are suffering on behalf of Christ. Whenever we suffer for being Christ's, we are suffering as his body here on the earth. I'm sure you'll all have heard of a remarkable woman, Dr. Helen Rosevere, who was an English missionary to the Congo, a missionary doctor. She was there during the time of the rebellion. She was captured, brutalised, shamefully treated and beaten. I remember she came up to Inverness, my hometown, to open a new Christian bookshop up there. And it was a remarkable experience. I'll never forget to hear her speak about her testimony. But she often used to speak about this and... Uh, whenever she was um, signing books or anything, she would always read from Philippians. Let's turn there. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. And she would write this verse in, in the front of the book. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. 
becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And I remember her saying very clearly, and I've heard it um, since then in recorded um, messages that she's given, that she was converted under the ministry of Graham Scroggy, who used to be at Charlotte Chapel, of course. I don't think he was there uh, when she was converted. But she says that uh, he had been doing some Bible classes when she um, was converted, and he gave her a Bible, he gave her this verse, and he said, well, today, Helen, you've come to know him. You've come to know Christ. And you will come to know more and more the power of his resurrection. But maybe one day he'll give you the privilege, Helen, of sharing in his sufferings. And as she was being beaten and brutalised and shamefully treated there in the Congo, this verse and, and this concept came back to her. That every strike on her cheek, every kick she received, was a strike and a kick against Christ and she there was filling up what was what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ filling up those persecutions that are still to come against the body of Christ and there's more to come friends I'm sure we just think don't we about our friends in the Ukraine who know and love the Lord Jesus and our heart breaks for them we think of those secret believers in Afghanistan who are undergoing dreadful persecution at the present time well the chapter uh, closes with this reference to the mystery now, uh, Ephesians is the central uh, epistle to think of when we think of the mystery. Something simply that was not made known in the old dispensation under the Old Testament system, and now through Christ and his apostles has been made known. How could it be possible that Gentiles like you and me, who have no relationship to the covenant nation of Israel, could come to call Jesus the Messiah our own and to know and love him? Well, it's all a mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory him we proclaim he says in verse 20 i love that him we proclaim what is it that bonus baptist church is desperate for the people of bonus to know about you could go and, and talk to them at length about your beliefs about about baptism or your beliefs about the second coming or uh, your opinions on politics or all sorts of things you might have opinions on and valuable and interesting it would be to listen to them. And, and I might have opinions about all sorts of things. But what is it that we want them to know about? We want them to know about him. About him. Him we proclaim. Him we proclaim. Paul's holy ambition was to present these believers mature in Christ. Christ was the subject. Christ was the goal. Christ was the great preoccupation of this remarkable man. And it was all according to God's strength, as we've said. Well, headship, holiness and hope. We have a headquarters which is in heaven and we're under marching orders, aren't we? To live lives of holiness set apart for God. And what a blessing to do that with our eye to the future, to the hope. And now we have hope of glory and it's Christ in us, that great down payment, and that guarantee of our inheritance that is the indwelling spirit as well. And with all of that, we look to the future when he's coming for us. Thank you for the opportunity to spend this time with you in the word of God. I trust um, that you'll be blessed and encouraged in the days that lie ahead. Amen. <laughs>